Welcome back to the course in nuclear medicine physics. Today we're continuing our discussion from the last lecture on task-based image quality assessment in medical imaging. In this lecture we'll look specifically at practical examples. So, uh, hello everyone once again. Uh, so now this, uh, we are going to talk about some practical examples of task-based image quality assessment in medical imaging. And again, the focus is going to be uh, providing with some examples in uh, radionuclide imaging. More specifically, actually, uh, I'll talk about an example in the context of SPECT. Uh, before I do that, I want to talk about this uh, virtual imaging trial framework to evaluate, uh, to do task-specific evaluation. So like I mentioned in uh, the uh, previous uh, part of the talk, uh, what we have is sort of like realistic, uh, we can, uh, the key components that are required to describe an, uh, or conduct an image quality evaluation on, on a specific task is A, specification of the task, B, describing the imaging process. Uh, so describe the imaging process, uh, and the patient population that you're imaging. Like I mentioned, we could ideally have like real patients and we could have like real systems on which they're imaged, but that's going to have a lot of logistical challenges. In contrast, we can use simulations. So we could have like a virtual population of patients. So here's a virtual population of patients using the XCAT phantom. Then we could model acquisition image reconstruction using our realistic simulations uh, software that would uh, kind of model the entire imaging physics. And then the next part, which is now we need an observer. So we could have like a virtual interpretation instead of actually having a human observer, we have like a virtual observer that looks at the images and uh, sort of looks at the images. It's a machine, uh, like an algorithm, but you can always have a human observer too. But in a virtual imaging trial framework, that would be like a mathematical observer, looks at the images and makes an inference on uh, let's say the task of defect detection. Is the defect present or absent? And then we have a figure of merit, such as in the detection task, ROC analysis. So with that quick recap and introduction of a virtual imaging trial, let me talk about a uh, an example, which actually is like two examples really. Uh, so I'll do a little bit of cheating here to present two examples by just giving one application. Uh, the example of transmissionless attenuation compensation for SPECT. So attribution compensation, uh, which I'll abbreviate as AC, is a prerequisite for quantification tasks and beneficial for visual interpretation tasks in SPEC. Now, attribution compensation requires an attenuation map. And conventionally, this is obtained using some kind of transmission scan, more often than not a CT scan. This has multiple disadvantages, additional radiation dose, uh, additional costs, uh, then uh, possibility of misregistration between the SPECT and the CT scans, but also very importantly, a large number of SPECT systems do not have a CT scan. Now, the top imaging centers, of course, we have a SPECT CT systems, but a lot of imaging centers don't. In fact, the emerging category of solid state detector SPECT systems, they do not have, uh, they may not have CT scans. A lot of mobile SPECT systems that can do SPECT imaging in remote locations, they may not have a CT. So to be able to do attenuation composite without having the CT is, is extremely powerful. Uh, now, uh, to address this issue, we developed a physics and deep learning based attenuation compensation approach that uses only the SPECT emission data. This work was actually funded by the NIB, NIBIB Trailblazer Award that uh, Dr. Rami mentioned at the beginning uh, towards in my introduction. Uh, this approach does not require, uh, that we are developing does not require a CT image that uses only the SPECT emission data. Now, I will not go into much detail on the approach. I'll just probably just uh, go through it very quickly. My goal is to show you how to evaluate this thing. So uh, here's a premise of the proposed method. So we, uh, in a SPECT system, we obtain uh, data in the photo peak window. So these, four, these are photons uh, that uh, are required in a certain photo peak window. For example, in technetium, this would be like a 126 to 154 keV uh, projection. This contains primarily photons that have not scattered, but there are photons that get scattered also. Then we have scatter window data. This data, uh, primarily consists of photons that have been scattered. And uh, the interesting thing is that this data is often thrown away. Uh, it's discarded. But uh, attenuation in SPECT is primarily to Compton scatter. So these photons may actually contain information to estimate the attenuation distribution. 
And we actually showed this theoretically that these photons using a Fisher information based approach, we actually demonstrate that these photons contain information to estimate that information distribution. Now, once uh, we demonstrate this theoretically, we, then we used a method that uses the scatter window spectrometry data to estimate that information distribution. For those of you who are interested in the theory behind how we demonstrate that these photons have information, I'd refer you to this publication uh, in inverse problems. Where so, you so from. if I may comment about this. So in this course, we first started talking about, um, you know, when you don't have CT or transmission, you do chunk correction. And then we said it's not the best thing on earth. And that's why people have moved away from it more towards CT systems, transmission-based systems, and, and more recently, CT-based systems. Uh, but now this is top-notch research. This is sort of taking a step uh, in a different direction. We, I actually alluded to this approach, in, I believe, in one of my lectures, having learned this kind of a framework from Abhinav himself. You know, maybe there is that information in the lower energy that we tend to throw away. Maybe we can use that information. So this is what the pioneering work that, that, that Abhinav has, has been leading. So we tend to think of things that, you know, we, we absolutely need CT, right? And then somebody else shows up and says, wait a minute, maybe, maybe in certain applications, maybe we could actually um, use some information that we're not using, which is what's happening here. So it's a top-notch research. Uh, thank you for the kind feedback, Arman. And I just want to add that this is me as a physicist who is thinking. You know, there are the idea here is not uh, that difficult. Actually, the, it's very simple, right? Attenuation in spec is due to scatter. So maybe the scattered photons contain information. Can we do get uh, kind of do good back projections if that's a very naive way of, or not a very simple, very trivial way of putting it? Can we do good back projections to actually get uh, the scatter? Uh, so let me let, let me ask you a question. We we looked at some energies and we said that at uh, you know really high energies, five eleven kV for a pet, there's no there's almost no photoelectric absorption in the body. At lower energies, there's some. But what you're saying is that even that sum is quite small compared to the primary you know dominance of the Compton scatter. Higher energies, it's even less of a factor. It's even lesser, right? Yeah. It's even less of a factor, but. At lower energies, I think there is still some photoelectric effect, but what you're saying is that if, when you looked at it at the end of the day, Compton was you know, very dominant, right? The dominant uh, scatter no, no, yeah, So the, you could sort of, for this application, really focus only on, on the Compton scatter. On the Compton scatter. Right. That is right, Armand. Yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, I, I think, uh, again, I think uh, you, you, all of you have already studied about reconstruction, but here the idea is that what do we do in reconstruction? We are actually modeling the physics of the photopeak photons. Can you model the physics of the scattered photons also? That was the key, uh, one of the key things at the start of this entire thing. Can we do this modeling of the physics? No, by no means trivial. It's a simple idea, but implementation is a different beast of its own. Because you remember, scatter can happen once, twice, and scatter can, uh, it's not a simple path that the photon takes. It goes through all kinds of paths. So what we found was that when we developed the reconstruction approach using simple physics, it was, uh, we developed a re nice reconstruction algorithm, but unfortunately it was uh, kind of very sensitive to, uh, to noise effects and it was not really uh, doing that well. And that's when we thought, how about we integrate this physics with deep learning? So the idea was that, uh, well, let's say we have a scatter sinogram and we do like an OSCM based reconstruction that gives us some initial estimate of the attenuation map. Now, what we do with this initial estimate of attenuation map, it's a reasonable estimate, but it's not the best. It's not going to tell me where the heart is or where the lungs are. What we do then is we segment this initial estimate of attenuation map into different regions. And for this segmentation, we use a deep learning based approach. Uh, once we have done the segmentation, we assign the attenuation coefficients, which gives us a final estimate of attenuation map. This estimate of attenuation map is then fed into another OSCM based approach to uh, estimate the activity. Uh, and that gives us an activity map. Not going to details on this, uh, happy to talk more about it, but I want to go to th uh, the next part, which is how do we know this thing works, right? So how do we objectively evaluate this proposed method? So I want to to talk about two clinical tasks. And this is why I'm cheating, right? I'm trying to have the single application. I'm talking about detection tasks and quantification tasks. So the detection task was in the context of myocardial perfusion spec. The task was detection of cardiac defects. And the quantification task was in the context of brain spec. The uh, task was quantification of uptake in the striatal regions. Uh, I should mention here that uh, this work, a lot of it was uh, led by a PhD student in my lab, Zetong Yu. 
uh, in collaboration with another PhD student, Arman, uh, sorry, uh, Ashikur Rahman or Ashik. So in each study, we also compared the performance of method to the case when an attenuation map was available, such as from a CT scan. And I'll show you some results also in comparing our methods with uh, the Chang's attenuation method. So the first study was the detection task, myocardial perfusion spect. So the objective was to evaluate the performance of our transmissionless attribution compensation approach on the task of detecting defects from, from cardiac spect images. So first goal achieved, we have specified the task, that of detection. Next, we need to describe the patient population. Right. So we used XCAT phantom to model our patients. This was very realistic. Organ, uh, the organ parameters were obtained such that they were representative of actual patient populations. The activity distributions within the different regions were obtained using patient populations. Considered more both male and female patients. Uh, then we also considered four different types of defects. Uh, so defects in different locations, defects with different severities, defects with different extents, and so on. Um, so again, again, trying to make it as clinically realistic as possible. And again, I want to emphasize in the AI world, it is very important that we account for this kind of patient population variability. Uh, in fact, if we had just the same patient being imaged every time, the AI algorithm would perform excellently well, right? You don't have to worry about anything because there's no variability the AI algorithm will learn. That's how my reconstructed image will look like. Uh, uh, that's how my original object would look like and so on. But to be, the, and therefore accounting for variability becomes so important. Uh, now, clinically realistic 3D anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic meaning human-like cardiac phantoms were simulated. It was all done in 3D, by the way. Then uh, next step in the OIC study, describing the imaging process, right? So now we have the activity map and attenuation map. We simulated a GE uh, spec system with a parallel hole low energy high resolution collimator to give us a photo peak sinogram and a scatter sinogram. For this purpose, we used a tool referred to as a cement. This is a Monte Carlo based tool, which models a lot of image, uh, most of the relevant image degrading process in spec uh, and it's validated. Uh, so this process yielded sinograms both in the photo peak and the scatter windows. So now step three, extract task specific information. So what's the task here? One of detection. So how do how well are we doing on the detection task? For this purpose, uh, first we need to be able to, of course, do the reconstruction of the images, right? So here's our scatter sinogram. We obtain our initial estimate of attenuation map. We did a training uh, using 800 pairs of initial attenuation estimations and corresponding segmented masks uh, to segment our initial estimate of attenuation map into lungs, soft tissue, muscle, spine, ribs, lung nodules, and background. Then we assign attenuation coefficients to these, giving us the final estimate of attenuation map. This was then fed into an OSM based approach to into which we fed the, also fed the photo big sonogram, giving us the final reconstructed activity. So, so instead of a physics-based approach, which was your previous work here, you're, you're using a AI to do the math. So right? we are combining physics and AI sorts of, so here is the physics, and For then the we are model, integrating it with right. AI. So uh, uh, I would probably uh, say it as we are kind of doing like an inversion model of the physics, but realizing that the inversion model of the physics is not uh, the most accurate. So the OSM based reconstruction kind of gives us that initial estimate to work with. Uh, but then we use AI in order to kind of post process this image in some sense. We are kind of post processing, even though it's a segmentation task and getting the final estimate of this map, but it's kind of that the information is there. It's available here. Uh, but um, not very visually uh, seen, but an AI-based algorithm is able to actually extract that and give us a final estimate of attenuation map. Uh, right. So, so you didn't know the true attenuation maps in this because typically, no, no, no. Right. I see. So you're okay. So it's not the typical neural network approach where you have known pairs, right? My image and my attenuation map, and then you learn the mapping somehow. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think what I would say is that what we did not have during the training process, we had just the segmented attenuation ma maps. Because the goal was to do the segmentation. Now, there are approaches that have been developed, and we actually looked at some of those ourselves too, where we said, let us use the known attenuation map in order to uh, uh, do the training. 
and we found that those work but our approach actually requires less training data because of the segmentation based approach it's kind of trying uh, accounting for the fact that these regions are contiguous and then they have constant kind of constant innovation coefficients within a certain region yeah, that makes sense thank so, you uh, and so i mean we are in some sense reducing the dimensionality of the problem we are not estimating things per pixel but we are estimating things over the entire region sorry i have actually really just gone breeze through this uh, and <laughs> i apologize for that uh, but uh, that's great if you have four co- more questions i'm happy to take them uh, yeah 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 i yeah, probably see one question did you use pre trained network no this was not pre trained uh, uh, farish they this was actually a uh, uh, trained uh, for the specific uh, task itself Okay. So now the next thing is, uh, you know, so we have now got the reconstructed images. Now next uh, step is, well, you have the reconstructed image. We want to still extract the task. Right? The task is to defect the de- detect the defect. And for this purpose, uh, there was an observer, a mathematical observer that was developed by Shin Li, uh, which basically under this paradigm. how do you go from segmentation to the estimated attenuation so once we have the uh, amir has a question on how do you go from segmentation to estimated attenuation map and the idea there is to assign predefined attenuation coefficients to the different regions so once i have the segmentation of the lung for example then i assign a uh, attenuation coefficient to that particular region uh, so uh does it answer your question Yeah, it's great. I, I think I think yeah. I think yeah, uh, it's become pretty clear now. I think I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, happy to. So, uh, reconstruction is only one part of the extraction of task based information. Like I said, the second part is to uh, you know know see whether the defect is present or not. That's the eventual goal that for which we are extracting the image. I want to make this point here and try to make this a little bit earlier also. Reconstruction may not always be needed. In this particular application, we are doing reconstruction, but there are approaches that are developed that directly use the projection data to do the detection task. In fact, one of which was developed by uh, in the context of diffuse optical tomography by uh, when I was doing my PhD. So. Uh, So here is the uh, estimate activity map. We uh, this is a case where we have what is referred to as signal known statistically task. Why is it signal known statistically? Because we the defect is present in multiple locations, has different severities, different extents, and background known statistically. So even the background is not perfectly known because we have a, a patient population variability. The patient sizes, organ sizes, uh, the patient uptake, all of this stuff is also varying. So. uh this is these are referred to as signal known statistically background known statistically tasks uh so that gives us the model of, uh, so then we apply uh, we have developed a mod sorry a model has been developed for this uh, study actually i was one of the co-authors on this paper uh which is then able to tell us that well uh, it's able to kind of do an observation and tell us whether the defect is present or not and so now comes the fourth component figure of merit to quantify task performance so once we have the model observed study done we obtain the roc plots and the auc values for which we purpose we used uh, software that's available uh, on the university of chicago website uh, so then once we had done this we compared the performance of method to two methods one which used a true attenuation map and the second one which uses a uniform attenuation map and so here is our results of the oix study you see this uh, blue line here denotes the roc obtained using the true attenuation map and you see the roc obtained using the proposed method there's a typo uh, and you see that it's almost perfectly overlaps with an auc of 0.76 when we use the uniform attenuation map we observe in contrast that the roc plot goes down indicating poorer detection performance so the roc plot yielded by the proposed method overlapped with that obtained using the true attenuation map and outperformed that with the uniform attenuation map so here's an example to show how we can use objective assessment image quality to demonstrate that our method actually performs well on a certain task these are some auc values again demonstrating the point that the auc with the proposed method was statistically similar to that obtained using true attenuation map and significantly higher than that obtained with the uniform attenuation map Uh, and i see that there are a couple of questions coming in but before that just for some visual feel to this uh, here is uh, here are some sample reconstructed activity maps here we see the true attenuation map uh, obtained images with defect absent and defect present cases um, 
and this is the one obtained using the proposed method. So activity maps obtained using the proposed method are visually similar to that obtained with the two attenuation maps. And here I also like to show a video of the attenuation map. Uh, there's a nice video, but I, I don't have it here right now, which uh, shows how the estimate of the attenuation map looks like. Uh, I'll probably show a little bit more of this uh, uh, in the next uh, task. But before that, I want to take the questions that have come by. We do have a hand raised okay. by Judy. So Judy, please go ahead. As, um, assuming. I think uh, it's, it's not see, Lenovo had a question. How yeah, are we getting I, those attenuation yeah. map? Is it through OSCM? Uh, so how do we get the attenuation map? So it's a, uh, it's a two stage process. Firstly, we do OSCM with the scattered photon data. Uh, and then second, after that, we uh, use the learning based approach to uh, use the scattered photon. Oh, okay. okay. So in the last five minutes that I have, I'll want to talk about the confident task in BrainSpect. Uh, here the task is confirmation obtained uh, in striatal regions. I want to present this for the sake of uh, it being a bit more comprehensive. You can you have seen the uh, detection task application. I would like to show you a confirmation task application. So here the task, first thing, specific task. The task was to quantify the uptake in different regions of a brain from a brain spectrum. The regions were caudate, putamen, and glubus palatus. Uh, the task was evaluating the ROI or the region of interest activity quantification. Uh, next, describing the patient population. Now here we took an approach where we used uh, actual clinical data um, to, so uh, where uh, with actual clinical CT scans as our population of the attenuation map and the corresponding activity maps were obtained using the MR defined uh, anatomical maps to which we assigned activities. Just breezing through this main point, the uh, the attenuation maps were actually obtained from the CT scan, so very clinical. Uh, activity maps were also obtained from the uh, patient populations, but activity values were assigned to them using, uh, uh, well, assigned to them by us. And the reason for this was because we wanted to know what the true value is within the different regions. Uh, so clinically guided 3D digital brain fitness were simulated. So this is very much a uh, a study that was kind of using clinical data. Uh, next, describe the imaging process. So we have the activity maps, we have the attenuation maps. You can see an attenuation map here. The patient is wearing a head holder. Uh, again, a parallel, the G spec system with a parallel hole low energy high resolution collimator was simulated, giving us the photo peak and the, uh, the scatter sinograms. Uh, then we extract the task specific information. So here is something that I would like to show you. So you see the OSCM based reconstruction. This patient is wearing a head holder and you can see this faint head holder here. And you're seeing this because of the initial OSCM based reconstruction. You are kind of account we are kind of accounting for the physics here. That's why we see this. And then when we use a learning based approach, there's the head holder that appears nicely. But I would say that if we did not have the physics based approach here, we would have never seen this head holder. It's because there is scatter that's occurring where the head holder is present that we actually see this. Uh, this faint edge which then translates into a much nicer head holder here. <clears throat> now, well, we have the estimated activity uh, map. So then the next goal is to extract the task specific information, which is regional activity uptake in corded putamen and glose palatus regions, which we did from the reconstructed activity images. Uh, before this, we actually also did the partial volume compensation uh, of the images. Next, we did uh, quantify the figure of merit. We obtained the figure of merit to quantify task performance. Here, we were interested in overall performance. So like I mentioned, right, bias, variance, now we are trying to incorporate both of them together. So we use this figure of merit called the normalized root mean square error. Think of it as, uh, you know, the bias square plus variance, uh, take, in this, take the square root and normalize that between the true and the estimated uptake. Uh, now we compare the results to a CT derived attenuation map and one obtained with the Chang's method as Arman alluded to an approach that's typically used when the attenuation map is unavailable. And here are the results of the objective assessment of image quality study. So you have the normalized root mean square error on the Y axis. These are the six regions, left putamen, right putamen, left caudate, right caudate, left globus paradis, right globus paradis. 
you want this error to be low and blue bar shows the error that's obtained with the CT based method. Green shows the error that's obtained with the proposed method and yellow shows the error that's obtained with the Chang's method. And in all cases, uh, what I was particularly delighted by was that there was statistically actually very little, uh, probably no difference between the uh, values that were obtained using the CT based and the proposed approaches for all six regions. And also our method, uh, the second thing to, uh, we noted was that our method outperformed the Chang's based approach for all the six regions. So the proposed method yielded similar performance to when the CT was used providing evidence that the method will enable performing attenuation compensation even without a CT scan. Uh, here are some sample reconstructed attenuation maps. Uh, and you can see here, these are the CT based attenuation maps. And these are what are obtained with our proposed method. You can see again, the head holder here. And there's a case where there's no head holder. You don't see that. Uh, visually, the CT based attenuation maps and estimated attenuation maps were very similar. Uh, some sample reconstructed activity maps also showing that. So here is a true attenuation map. Here is the proposed method. And here is what we obtained with the Chang's method. And our results show the image generated using the proposed method were visually similar to that obtained with the CT derived attenuation maps. And we actually implemented a pretty good Chang's approach here. We were not trying to create a straw man. Actually, this was a very nicely created, uh, ni very uh, state of the art Chang's approach used. Uh, Amir, yes, that's right. In the proposed method, we do not use a CT scan. So again, that was very quick, uh, but hopefully it gave you a feel for how you can do these kind of image quality evaluation studies. Uh, so I would summarize by saying, and I'm exactly at 12.30, uh, that's good timing. Uh, nuclear medicine images are required for specific tasks. Objective assessment of image quality provides an excellent mechanism for task-based image quality assessment. Key components of an org study, specify the task, describe the object model and the imaging process, uh, process, define the process to extract the task specific information and define figure of merits to quantify task performance. And once you have done these four things rigorously, you would be able to say whether your imaging system performs well on the task or not. That's a summary. And with that, I'd like to conclude uh, by firstly saying thank you. Uh, thanks to all the pioneers in this field who have uh, done incredible work. Uh, here's Dr. Harry Barrett, uh, Dr. Matt Kupinski, my PhD advisor, Dr. Eric Fry, Dr. Eric Clarkson, Dr. Hameem, uh, and several others whom I don't have in this uh, slide here uh, for all the work that they have done that has advanced these, this field significantly. Uh, the research that I presented has been supported by uh, the NIBIB Trailblazer Award, but also uh, I would like to thank my collaborators who have helped me with that research and uh, the leadership at WashU that has helped provide an excellent environment for this research. Uh, and of course, <laughs> I want to thank members of my lab, the students who have actually implemented those physics and learning based approaches that I've shown to you. Ashaik and Zitong uh, in particular uh, were instrumental in uh, in these uh, in the project I showed, but we have been also working on some uh, several other exciting projects, uh, for example, in the context of segmentation, in the context of uh, a quantitative spec and so on. And uh, yeah, I'm just uh, fortunate and delighted to have such excellent students in my lab. But with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Uh, and uh, thank you for your feedback. I really appreciate that in an online setting. It's uh, uh, great to have uh, people ask questions, people be responsive. It just makes the whole lecture so much more engaging. Uh, and I want to uh, open the floor to questions now, if you have any further questions. So, so, uh, I don't know. If, uh, we'll wait to see if there are any questions. I, I wanted to say that we are very fortunate to have you uh, ha having had accepted this invitation and, and taking us to this world of task-based image assessment, which is obviously uh, very, very important. So thank you very much on behalf of all of us. Um, and because I don't see any hands raised or any questions here, we're going to end the lecture here. Thank you again very much.